There's a lot of times where we may see someone and we know who they are. In other words, someone may see Charlie and know that he's one of the elders, but they don't remember his name. And so they may say, look, I, I see him. I, I know that he's one of the elders, but what's his name? The Bible answers that question when it comes to God. I know there's a God, but what's his name? His name is Jehovah. And what that means is I am who I am. And so I and am are your other two words. I am. That's who Jehovah is. And that phrase I am is one that's used a lot of times in the scriptures. And it's used a lot of times even in the, in the New Testament, especially in the book of John to talk about Jesus Christ. And we're going to draw a connection between Jehovah and Jesus Christ tonight in our study. Okay, so Jehovah, I am, is what we're going to be talking about. So in uh, the verse that was read for us, there's, been a, there's always been a running dialogue throughout the Scriptures. That from the beginning, God, Elohim, the Creator, made all things. From that time forward, He used the things in which He did to reveal who He is. And though Jehovah is the name that is used even there in the beginning in several cases where it says the Lord, Jehovah, God, El Jehovah, Elohim, created all of these things. It was not until much later that men started actually using that name because this is a name that, that puts us into a much more personal, as I said a moment ago, relationship with God. In Isaiah, when he is talking to those people, he lets them know that the Lord, uh, the, the New King James uses this in, verse, uh, in Isaiah 26 and verse 4. Trust in Jehovah forever, for in Yah, Jehovah, is everlasting strength. Yah is a form or a shortened form of Jehovah. It's almost like an abbreviated form of that. And that's something that you're going to see throughout the Psalms. And so don't get confused with that, and we'll explain some of that more as we go. But Jehovah is the one that is translated, and we've, we've touched on this before. In your Bibles, when you, say, when you see L-O-R-D, Lord, in all capital letters, that is Jehovah or Yahweh in the Hebrew manuscripts. Sometimes it may be that it's a capital L, and then it's got, it almost looks like it's lowercase, but they're also capitals themselves, L-O-R-D. That's the same thing. That is different from when you see capital L and smaller case, O-R-D, Lord. That is Adonai. And if you remember that from our first lesson, what that means is master or the one who is in charge of these things. And it's important to distinguish those two things because Jehovah is the one that is most frequently used as the name of God in the Bible. About 6,800 times, more than 6,800 times, Jehovah is the one that is used within the scriptures. And it's real easy to get confused, though, on what's being talked about. Are we talking about God and his, in the sense of him being master? Or are we talking about God in the sense of him being Jehovah, the one that we have this personal understanding and relationship with? There is something that is communicated that is different in the use of the two separate words. And that's why it's important to study them. The first time that it is used is in Genesis uh, 2 and verse 4, where it says that this is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that Jehovah, the Lord, Jehovah, God, Elohim, made the heavens and the earth. And so in the beginning, we see that it was not just any God or that a God or that some God or that many gods created the heavens and the earth. The history is this, is that God created the heavens and the earth. Well, someone may say, well, which God? There are many gods that are served. There are many gods that are believed in. Just so that we're clear, it was Jehovah. What you do not see in the scriptures is you do not see them saying, the Jehovah Elohim. You don't see that. You see Jehovah, the God. And the reason being is because in the Hebrew mind, the Jewish mind, and indeed in our minds, there's no such things as many gods. But if you remember the term Elohim, it is plural in nature. And so there are many different gods that are served by a lot of different people. But it does not mean that they are true. And so the Elohim, the God, what is his name? It is Jehovah, as we'll be looking at. In Genesis 28 and verse 13, this is a, a, a more literal translation of that verse. So it's not going to be exactly the same as, as any of our, our Bibles, but it's more literally. I am Jehovah. The Elohim of Abraham, your father, and the Elohim, the God of Isaac. The reason that, that that is important to remember is that one of the things that we're going to see that's inherent in the actual name of God, Jehovah, is that he is eternal. 
Trust in Jehovah forever. Trust in Jehovah always. Trust in Jehovah in all circumstances. Trust in uh, Jehovah for all generations. The reason being is because God is not one who did exist or that will exist. God is. I am who I am. And we're going to see that inherent in his name. And so when we get to passages such as, as these that teach us about Jehovah, it is that personal, most intimate name of God. A, a couple of verses that, that bear that out. Psalm 68. Psalm 68. And let's look at verse 4 together. Psalm 68 and verse 4. Sing to God, sing to Elohim, sing praises to his name, extol him who rides on the clouds by his name, Yah, which is that shortened form of, of Jehovah or Yahweh, and rejoice before him. The scriptures do point out over and over again that his exact name is this. The reason, again, that that is important is because this is the only name that we have in the scriptures that is not tied into an incident, a time, an act of wonder, a promise, or some other such thing that has taken place where God is called by a name because of a certain event. This is the name that God has taken for himself. And this is the, the name by which he introduces himself to his creation. In Isaiah 42, in verse 8, back to Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 8. The New King James says, I am the Lord. The actual translation is, I am Jehovah. That is my name. And my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images, because none of them are as he is. So again, when we start talking about his name, the, the Moabites had gods, and they called his name Chemosh. You, you had the, the Philistines who had gods. You remember Dagon. Dagon was the one that uh, the, the things of God were put there and Dagon was placed beside and then Dagon's on his face the next morning and all those types of things happen. And it was to show that even Dagon is bowing down and cannot stand and cannot survive in the presence of Jehovah, the Lord God of Israel. It's an important concept because there are many names that's been given to a lot of different gods. And so in Exodus chapter 3, it would seem, and this is the first time in scriptures where you have the emphasis that is actually placed upon the name Jehovah. Not the first time it's used but the first time that real emphasis is placed upon it. And when you think about what it is that Moses says in this passage, it's actually pretty irrever irreverent and irrelevant, the questions that he asks, even though God does answer them. In Exodus 3, this is an account with a burning bush. Moses said to Elohim, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The Elohim of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And Elohim said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. The reason that it is an irreverent question is because if this is indeed the God of the forefathers, that means that he has always existed and always will exist. And God had already promised, Elohim had already promised that he was going to deliver the children of Israel from their bondage and that Moses was going to be the one who's going to be an instrument of those types of things. If this Elohim is able to take a bush, set it on fire, and the bush itself is not consumed by the fire, who can maintain such a thing as that? So it is both ir irreverent and it's also irrelevant because his name doesn't matter because he's actually existed before all times. And so when God does give the name, it's an odd statement to us many times the way that God answers this question. He says, I am who I am. That term am that is used in, in that verse is very significant because it is tied into many of the ideas of Jehovah himself. Am is from a Hebrew word that carries the idea of to exist or to be. When you think about Jehovah, it's also derived from the exact same Hebrew verb, which is similar to the Hebrew Chava, which is to live or to life. What that means is that Jehovah is without beginning. He is without end. He is able to consume, right? He is able to do. He is able to be. He is able to exist without being consumed himself, much like the burning bush itself was. It was able to burn, but it was never depleted. 
And so when we think about some of the things that the Bible talks about that are eternal, that mess with our minds a lot, like eternal condemnation. And it talks about a fire that burns and burns and burns, and yet what it is burning is never consumed. That's because the one who is able to do such a thing is I am who I am. He is Jehovah. The one who is able to make a, a, a maggot, basically, a worm that does not die. And it continues to eat and eat and eat upon something that is never consumed. The reason that he is able to do that is because he is Jehovah Elohim. He is the never-ending, always sufficient, and completely self-sufficient. He is the source and the, the product of life itself. And within, with Jesus, or with uh, God, however, rather, there is no any, uh, end or beginning from the very start. And so when we think of Jehovah, we think of he who is absolutely self-existent. He, he's the one himself who possesses all the essentialities of life and also permanent existence. One example of this is in Isaiah 43 and verse 10, where God says, I am he. Again, it's very interesting because the scriptures will sometimes use just that expression, he, to identify with God. I am he. Who is it who can do such things? God says, I am he. Who is it who can give life? I am he. There are a lot of gods that others serve that they believe would be able to take your life, but only Jehovah is the one who can truly give life and sustain life. So he says, I am he. Before me, there was no Elohim formed nor shall there be after me. I, even I, am Jehovah, and besides me, there is no Savior. God makes it perfectly clear that there is no one besides him, never has been, never will be, and he is the self-existent one. And so this name denotes that the person and the actual substance of, of God himself. So as we're talking about this, so, so then what is the significance for me? When I think about Jehovah and use the name Jehovah, What's the big deal then? What, what would be different than just using God or using Lord? The same as it is with a relationship that you might have with a person, that you know that this person is, as, as I used the example of Charlie earlier, that you may know that he's one of the elders, but you may not know his name. Once you know his name, it's because you're probably gaining more of a personal relationship with him. The names that you know that person by, especially the name that they want to go by, makes it sure that you have communicated enough with that person to know some things about him. It is so awesome to think about that when I pray to my God, when I pray to Jehovah, that is not a different person or a different individual than what was there in Genesis 1 and 1 that said, let there be light, and there was light. That that is, no, that is not a different person than the very one who said to Adam and Eve, do not eat of that tree because the day you do it, you will die. It is not different from the one who chased them from the garden because he could not be in the presence of sin. But it's also, he is not different than the one who said that I will make sure that there is a way to reconcile all of mankind to myself. It is not a different God. It is still Jehovah, the same God who saw the earth and everything he created and said, I am sorry that I made mankind and I'm going to destroy all that are on the face of this earth with a flood. But it is also the same God that in the midst of all of that did not neglect to see and notice one man and his family and find out that that man, Noah, had grace in the eyes of Jehovah. And that Jehovah said, I will save all of mankind because of him. And so that Jehovah who controls all and has done all and is all powerful, he is the El Elyon that we, we talked about. He is the Elohim that we talked about. But he is also Jehovah that knows and sees each and every one of us individually. That is not that we know him personally by name, but he knows us personally by our name. When he appeared to Moses in the burning bush, he said, Moses? When Jesus went to the grave of Lazarus, he didn't just say, get up. He called Lazarus forth. Our names, it is said, are recorded in the Lamb's book of life. God will judge, Jehovah will judge each one of us according to each man's works. And you're not going to be judged as a whole of humanity because Jehovah knows 
you. Jehovah, when we talk about the scriptures and what it teaches about him, he is indeed the, the God of revelation. There was, never has been and never will be a God, an Elohim, created that can tell us what's going to happen, and it happens. There's never been an Elohim, a God formed or created, that can tell us the things of the past with clarity. But one of the things that you see is in that 6,800 times that the scriptures use the name Jehovah, many times this is the name that God chooses to use when he reveals himself or reveals something about himself to his people. In Exodus 6 and verse 2, And Elohim spoke to Moses and said to him, I am Jehovah. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as El Shaddai, God Almighty, that we'll look at in the future. But by my name Jehovah, I was not known to them. I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan. God said that the full significance of his name, Jehovah, was not revealed to even Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But he is now revealing that glory of that name and how significant that name was to Moses. And you see that it's in the very midst of and in re relation to a revelation of something that's going to happen. God is revealing himself. When we know God enough to be able to call him by his name, that's because God has revealed some things about himself. If, if you are one who's been putting these things into practice that in your prayer life you use some of the names that we've studied so far, that's a commendable thing. But at the very beginning, it would be something understandable that's probably a little bit awkward because you're not used to it. But the more you get used to who God is, the more comfortable you are with using the name that God says, this is my name. My name is Jehovah. I am the God that you've been talking to. I am the God that your parents served. I am the God that your grandparents served. I am the God that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob served. I am the God that Moses served. I'm the God that David served. I am the God that came to the earth and dwelt in flesh among men. I am Jehovah. That is my name. That is powerful to think about. He is that God of revelation, and he's always been revealing himself to his creation. He's also... A, is one that is to be held in reverence. Even his name itself in Leviticus 24 and verse 16. And whoever blasphemes the name of Jehovah shall surely be put to death. And all the congregation shall surely stone him, the stranger, as well as him who was born in the land. When he blasphemes the name of Jehovah, he shall be put to death. This is just one of many occasions where God says that you shall not take my name in vain. This is one of many occasions where God says, my name is to be exalted, it is to be glorified, it is to be magnified, it is to be held in reverence, it is to be something that you, you have upon your hearts, it is to be something that you are to walk along beside, it is the name that you are to trust in. Over and over and over again, God says that my name is not to be diminished. Don't use it unless you know what it is. That's why God took a long time to gradually reveal it to his creation. Don't use it if you don't know what it is and what it means. And when you use it, hold it in reverence. Because this is the name that will save all of mankind. This is my name personally. You may say a lot of things about, someone, about, about fathers in our country. But don't say that about me as a father. And the reason that I would say such things like that to other men my children, or to others, is because there are many fathers in our country, but I'm not like the rest of them. We hold ourselves up as being different than that because of who we are and what we do, and that's what God does. You do not use my name the same way you would the name Dagon or Molech or one of these other gods that all these others serve. I'm not like them. I am the Elohim, Jehovah. He is separate and distinct. And so his name must not be blasphemed. It should be held in reverence. Also, the scriptures point out that Jehovah is also righteous. For the Lord, it says in Psalm 11 and verse 7, For Jehovah is righteous. He loves righteousness. His countenance beholds the upright. The scriptures point out over and over again that Jehovah is the one who is righteous because he is the source. His name means forever. His name means continual. His name means never ending. It's the name he chose for himself. I am who I am. And by that he means I am righteous. 
It's not that he just does what is righteous. And it's not just that he loves righteousness. But the reason that he does and loves these things is because that's who he is. That's his very character. Other scriptures point this out as well. In Leviticus 19, verses 1 and 2, it says, And Jehovah spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel, and say to them, You shall be holy, for Jehovah your Elohim am holy. When we turn to passages like that in, in the New Testament where Peter quotes from this passage, I think sometimes it loses its meaning in, in our translation. It's not that a God, a deity, would have to be holy and have to be righteous, but that among all those who may call themselves a God, there is only one who is true, and his name is Jehovah. And when, one of the things that you know about Jehovah not just because he has said it, but because he has proven it and shown it, and it is exactly who he is. He is holy. Jehovah is holy. The God, Jehovah, is holy. And so when I start looking toward what it is that I need to be about in my life when it comes to holiness, we often use the, the analogy that many in this world use. You have to have a goal higher than yourself. Having a goal higher than yourself will not make you holy. Being like Jehovah will. And that's different. Many gods are created, many standards are created that are higher than us. Goals that we set themselves could be considered gods in some, in some senses. However, Jehovah is a standard to himself. You don't have a say-so in what that standard would be. Because... I am who I am. Holiness is what holiness is. And it doesn't change. It doesn't change from Genesis to Exodus to Leviticus to Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, and throughout the rest of the Old Testament and even into the New Testament. And in the thousands of years that have passed since, holiness does not change because Jehovah is who he is. And holiness is always the same. Truth is always the same. That's the significance of when we talk about Jehovah and knowing who he is. We have passages such as Habakkuk 1 and verse 13, where Habakkuk says, You are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. The, the uh, evil and the wickedness that he spoke of was different than what some of those would have comprehended in Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers but it was still the exact same thing. It was evil, and God cannot look upon it. There are other things that the Scriptures point out as being significant as well, and it talks about God being love. Jehovah is love. The New Testament says God is love. The word that's used in the, in the New Testament many times is the word kurios, and it carries with it a very similar type of idea, but it doesn't carry the same type of weight of significance as in the Old Testament where it talks about Jehovah. Jehovah is love. Jehovah says in Jeremiah 31 and verse, 30, and verse 3, I have loved you with an everlasting love. And I want you to think about that for just a moment. These, these other passages are some that you can look at on your own, but in Judges 10 and Isaiah and in Hosea, these are just a few examples of when God, when Jehovah looked upon his people and he would see them oppressed, either because of other nations, because of their own leaders, because of some of the things that were going on with, with uh, captivity and bondage, when these types of things were going on, Jehovah many times put them in this situation. But when they began to cry out, not to the gods of the other nations, but they realized there is only one Elohim, there is only one God, and they began to call once again upon the name of Jehovah, that God looked upon them, and he had that same love that he always had for them. And these verses say that God would hurt, that he would have pain, that he would have anguish of heart, that he would feel grieved when he looked upon the, the problems of his children. Jehovah will allow you to make your own decisions. Jehovah will allow you to serve other Elohims, other gods. But he tells you there are severe consequences that come along with that. You will find bondage. You will find pain. You will find anguish. 
you will find despair. But when you return to Jehovah and recognize that of all the things in this world that I could seek after, there is only one who has always been and who has always loved me, and that is Jehovah. Because Jehovah will let you make your own choice. He will let you suffer your own consequences. And he grieves every day when he sees the pain that it causes you. Again, Jehovah is that name that holds us most closely to that uh, relationship with God that is most personal. Jehovah is also one who redeems. This is very interesting. I want us to turn to these two passages. Genesis chapter 6. Genesis 6. <clears throat> you remember Genesis 6 is where Noah finds grace in the sight of God because he was one who walked with God in Genesis 6 and verse 9. And in, in these passages you see that the ark is being prepared, that God has given to Noah instructions on how to build the ark. And in Genesis 6 and verse 22 it says that thus Noah did according to all that Elohim commanded him, so he did. Now when you turn to chapter 7, there's the different term for God that is used in verse 5 where it says, and Noah did according to all that Jehovah commanded him. <laughs> there's a very interesting thing that happens between those two verses. First, he is given instructions on creating this ark, building this ark. And he did according to what the creator told him to do. But in chapter 7, you see that as he begins to take things upon the ark, he starts taking these animals with him, these clean and unclean animals on the ark with him, according to what Elohim had commanded. But the reason that he did as Jehovah commanded, because these animals are about to be used at the end of chapter 7 for sacrifices, so that they might be, mankind might be reconciled or brought back together and have a covenant with Jehovah. That God is no longer the one who is just saying, do these things because this needs to be created. But to take these animals and do these things because you need to be one, mankind needs to be one once again with Jehovah. And so it's interesting that God, even though he is one who is righteous, pure, holy, his name is to be held in reverence. And so he cannot look upon that which is wicked. And it grieves his heart when he sees it. So much so that at one time he even destroyed all of mankind off the face of the earth. He is also the God that loves so much, so eternally, an eternal love, that he wants mankind to be reconciled. And so with Noah, he made this covenant. And that promise still stands even with us today. So Jehovah is one who changes not. In Malachi 3 and verse 6, it says, For I am Jehovah, I do not change. It's an interesting thing because in the New Testament we're told in Hebrews 13 and verse 8 that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If Jehovah changes not and Jesus Christ changes not, what does that tell us about our Savior, Jesus Christ? You remember the passage that we, we read a few moments ago. There are no other gods formed. There haven't been, there ever will be. And there is no other God, no other Elohim who saves. There is no other Savior but me. It's interesting that when you get to the New Testament, that one of the things that's revealed is that Jehovah reveals himself in the person of Jesus Christ. That Jesus is Jehovah. He is the everlasting God. Jesus is who he is. Jesus is not who you might want him to be. And Jesus doesn't change because of public opinion, current trends, social statuses and norms. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is who he is. Jesus himself made that plain as he talked to others. In John 8 and verse 58, Jesus said this. Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, what word did he use? I am. Not I was before Abraham. I am. And when those Hebrew people, those Jewish people heard that phrase, they knew exactly who Jesus was claiming to be. Jesus said that I am the bread of life. I am the one who gives sustenance. I am the one who supplies when your forefathers, generations before you walked the earth, were wandering through the desert and they were hungry and they were wandering like pilgrims through all these foreign lands, being punished by Jehovah, you know who fed them? I did. I did. I'm that bread. And so if you need sustenance now, if you need to be fed now, not with a physical bread, but what, what God was truly trying to teach them, the man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, who is it who feeds you? Jesus says, I am. I am who I am. 
Jesus also said in John 4 and verse 14 that he is that living water. You remember the account with the woman at the well that Jesus is there and he asked her about this water and he says that, you know, if you knew who it was who were speaking to you, you would ask for this water. You'd never thirst again if you were to drink this water that I would give you. We know the correlation to us today that when we come to Jesus, we drink from that water, we obey that gospel, we are saved from our sins, we receive that salvation. And it saves us so utterly, fantastically beyond everything that we need that we never are in want for some other source of salvation, for some other source of water. Because salvation is what it is. And so you can't take and manipulate and change and say, well, this group says, I want to be saved this way. I want to be saved that way. Salvation is not based upon finite man, but an infinite Jehovah. And salvation is what it is. And God says, just as it was in the day of Noah, if you want to be saved from the flood, get in the ark. Salvation is is what it is. It's on God's terms. It's a grace that's been extended to you, but you have to accept it. Jesus says, I am that living water. Drink from it, and you'll have that salvation that you're looking for. In John 8 and verse 12, Jesus points out that he is the light who shows the truth. But more specifically, Jesus is letting us know that he is your light. He is the one who leads you into truth. Because I know the name Jesus. And the reason that I know the name Jesus is the same reason that most of us in this audience know that name. is because we stood before an audience of people and we said this. We believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of Jehovah. We believe that He is God, Jehovah, in the flesh. And because of that, He is my source of truth. What is your source of truth? You ever really thought about that? What is your source of truth? I'm not going to say, hey, and then, you know, a mobile device because everybody's phone might go off. But sometimes we use that hey feature on our phone to tell us what is the truth about something. Or we may use Facebook. We may use some other platform of some kind, and it becomes our source of truth. But brethren, Jehovah is all truth. He is who he is, and he cannot deny himself. So Jesus says he is your light. He's the one who shows you the truth. In John 10, which is such a beautiful chapter, Jesus talks about being the good shepherd. But understand this, that he is not a good shepherd. He is the good shepherd. He is Jehovah, the good shepherd. There has never been a shepherd like Jehovah. There will never be a shepherd like Jehovah. And Jehovah is is the one who opens the door that you might come into the sheepfold. He is the one who leads you gently. And you remember what it says when it says this in John 10? His sheep recognize not a voice, his voice. Because there's only one voice. And that's the voice of Jehovah. That is the voice of Jesus. In John 11, in verse 25, Jesus points out that he is the resurrection and the life. Jesus is the one that when he comes again, if I, if I be found in the grave at that time, Jesus Christ, when he comes back and he makes that call, I'm going to respond to it. He is my resurrection. He is my life. When I was baptized for the forgiveness of my sins, it was because of Jesus Christ. Not because of someone else, but because of him. Because of his promise. I don't believe in those things just because those things are out there for a person to do. I believe in the one who commanded those things, who gave me the opportunity for those things because I know what his name is. His name is Jehovah. He is who he is. And that doesn't change because of me liking it or disliking it or arguing with it or finding reasons not to do it. I am who I am. Jesus also said in John 14 and verse 6 that he is the way, that he is the truth, that he is the life. And it's no doubt then and no wonder why then that Jesus says no one can come to the Father except through me. There is no other avenue because Jesus is who he is. He's that way that opens up to eternal life. In John 15 verses 1 and, and verse 5, he talks about being the, the vine and the branches. 
he gives that, that illustration. And we see that Jesus is the source and provider of every spiritual need that we might have. Jesus is Jehovah. I am who I am. Do you know him? The question I want to leave you tonight is, are you trusting in Jehovah? Do you know the name of your Savior? Because there is only one. There's never been, never will be someone else. It is him. That gives us steadiness. That gives us surety. And that gives us to put our, something to put our complete faith and allegiance in because he does not change. He has told us and he will not relent. His love is one that was from everlasting to everlasting and it extends to you this night. If you don't know who Jehovah is and you're ready to obey the gospel, if you want to be part of his kingdom, this is your opportunity. If you want some more information about these things or have questions that you want to ask, please let us know. We'd love to be able to sit down with you and, and introduce Jehovah more fully to you. If you're subject to the invitation, won't you please come as together we stand and sing.